Okay, so moving on with MO theory. So we were on this slide going through the examples. We hadn't really started on the examples yet. Why don't normal gases form diatomic molecules? So we had sort of touched on this one already, but let's actually draw out a couple of these diagrams. One, to give us some practice, you know, remind you of how to do it, and two, to do this explanation. Odds are, if I were to ask this on an exam, I would probably ask you to give me some reasoning for it that would involve the MO diagrams. So we answered it last time quickly. Now I want to go a little bit more in depth. So let's just look at a couple of examples. Let's take the first two, since that's really all we've been able to deal with so far. So let's look at helium and neon. Just so that we can you know, use these to explain it. So first of all, for helium, we would draw out the diagram. We always draw out the atomic orbitals too. It's not correct if you don't have the atomic orbitals. You'll notice I tend to draw brackets instead of dotted lines. Honestly, it's just because I have a hard time drawing perfectly straight lines all the time and it gets a little messy. I, the brackets to me are a little bit cleaner, but it really makes no difference. I'm gonna set it up like that. Now labels. Don't forget to label everything. A lot of you guys did that on your atomic orbital or your atomic energy level diagrams on the first test. Don't do that here. So this will be a 1s, 1s. As with all charts, we need to label our axes. So we're going to label that and say that's energy. Now we have to decide what we have here. So we're combining the s orbitals, and what do we get out of that? Sigmas. So am I done labeling? What did I forget? Forgot a star, good. So now am I done? Good. You have to put the subscripts in. So I realize that gets a little tiny since I'm doing subscripts of something small already. So that subscript says 1s because it comes from the 1s orbital. Okay, so that's sort of our, our basic outline. Now, how many electrons does helium normally have? Just one helium? Two. We can go like that. Now we fill them in. We don't really have to worry too much about where everything comes from. We just, we have, how many electrons total do we have? Four. So we start low or high? Low. One, two, three, four. Okay. Anything else we need to do to make this diagram complete? Nope, where's that? So let's look at this a second now and say, well, why would this or would this not form? Why could we form helium two plus? To do that, let's look at the bond order. And a couple of different ways of looking at this. The, more f the most formulaic way is to say, well, it's one half times by the bonding electrons minus the antibonding. So we'll figure that out. So it's one half. How many orbitals in bonding, or how many electrons in bonding orbitals do we have? Two, right? Just from here. And then how many in antibonding? It's just from the ones with the star. So it's two. So what's our bond order? Zero. Well, if it's a bond order of zero, does that, is that forming a bond? No. So for that noble gas, there's not going to be a bond. So it's not going to form that. Now, of course, at this point, you're probably saying, well, Neon will do the same thing. But let's go ahead and make it just for some extra practice. So let's just do valence. So I only want the two. I only want the n equals two level. So if we do that, we first have to draw out our atomic orbitals. <coughs> like this. Sorry, that should be a two. Two s and two s. And since I put valence up here, we're only going to draw out the, the n equals two level. 
Now we have to sort of make some decisions here. So down here, if we combine these, what are we going to get? Two orbitals, four orbitals, three orbitals, two. One will be high, one will be low. What are their names? Sigma and sigma star with the 2s labeling on the bottom. So since I realize it's getting small, 2s and 2s is down there. OK, now we have to make some decisions. When we come up here, we know that we're going to have how many molecular orbitals? Six. But we have to make a decision about which one's going to be the lowest. Is the sigma going to be lower or is the pi one's going to be lower? In this case, it's the sigma, right? So remember that there's sort of that flip-flop that happens between um, nitrogen and oxygen. So oxygen, fluorine, and neon are going to have this pattern. Okay? Where your sigmas are on your outside, your top and bottom. And remember the subscript down here now is going to be 2p because it comes from the p orbital and up here 2p because it comes from the p orbital. And then this, ah, these will both be pi's. And don't forget your star for your bond or your anti-bonding orbital. And then the subscripts will be 2p and 2p. So we have sigma 2p star, pi 2p star, pi 2p, sigma 2p, okay? Now, people have asked me, does it matter how far the energy levels are apart? Because in my slides from last week, you know, I showed you that nice diagram with them all laid out, and I showed you where they were kind of, you know, incrementally going down and then flipping with these bottom two. For drawing these, it doesn't actually matter so long as you get the order right. I can't, I can't ask you to gauge, you know, put these closer than these or something like that. That would be way too hard to gauge. And it's kind of beyond the scope of this class. The only reason I showed all those little differences in the energy levels when I showed it to you on the slide was so that you could get that idea that, you were having, that these energy levels, it wasn't just a hard flip-flop in between that nitrogen and oxygen, that it was sort of a gradient and it's just where it happened to flip. Okay? But as far as drawing these, don't worry about where the energy levels are. Now, something that is important, and we won't, I mean, I don't want you breaking out measuring sticks or anything, but these should split about equally across from the P. This should be about the same distance as that, and this should be about the same distance as that. Again, don't break out the measuring sticks, but, or rulers, but, you know, make it look about like this. You don't want your P orbitals to be way up here, or your P orbitals to be way down here. They should be in the center, okay? Just like here, our two S's are kind of in the center of our two sigmas, okay? So just try to keep it approximately symmetrical. That's the only thing I care, is that your atomic orbitals should be in about the center of the energies. Okay. So now we get to fill everything in. So how many valence electrons does neon have? Eight. So we fill it all in. So of course when we go to do this, we have that. And if we figure out our bond order there, well, we have the exact same number in bonding or orbitals as antibonding again. So we can go ahead and count them and say how many are in bonding orbitals. Two, four, six, eight, and then two, four, six, eight. So our bond order is once again zero, right? So if I ask you, well, why doesn't, why, why don't these noble gases form diatomic, or diatomic molecules, and I ask you to use MO theory to explain it, I mean, there's other ways of explaining it, of course. You could just use sort of pre- midterm two logic, so like the stuff that we learned during midterm one period, and say, well, that's, you know, because they have a full valent shell and they're stable. If I asked you to use MO theory to explain it, you could say, well, it's because their bond order is zero. So if you were to make this, you would see that you have no bond. Just different ways of explaining the same sort of phenomena. Okay, let's go back for a sec. 
So MO diagram shows bond order of zero. It's a lot of work to get to that answer, but you know, it's good review. I sort of wanted to do some review on drawing MO diagrams and doing it from scratch. That is the sort of MO diagram that you will be expected to be able to do next Friday, okay? All right, which species has the longer bond length, N2 or O2? So this is, again, falls under the category of there's a couple of different ways you can figure this out and a couple of different ways that you can explain it. However, let's go ahead and explain it with MO theory. So now that we um, have drawn this from scratch a few times, I'm gonna cheat for the sake of time and move back to this slide. Okay, so let's look at O2 and N2 since those, that's what I asked you to look at. Okay, so we're looking N2 and O2 and we're saying which one has the longer bond length? So what do we know about bonds? If we have a really, if we have a triple bond, what sort of, is that gonna have a short bond length or a long bond length? Short, right? It's gonna be short, it's gonna be holding everything closer to each other. So a single bond would have a longer bond length. So you basically just rank them in order of their bond order. So for, ox or for oxygen and nitrogen, you have a bond order of three here and a bond order of two here. So which one's gonna be your longer one? Oxygen. Oxygen will be longer, nitrogen will be shorter. Okay? Again, if I ask this on a test, I might ask you to draw the MO diagram too, but you would just be able to draw these two. Okay. So for carbon monoxide, I say that the p orbitals combine in a way where the energy is pi sigma, pi star, sigma star. So I've told you the order of the energies, and I say draw the MO diagram. And then I ask what the bond order is. So this is the way that I would go ahead and I would ask you to draw a diagram of a heteronuclear diatomic, or two different nuclei. So let's go ahead and just draw this from scratch. Mostly because I think it's good practice. We have it up on the board too, but I would rather do it from scratch. Okay, so I say CO. And I say draw the MO diagram. I had to tell you the ordering. So now we know that we can set up our diagram to look like that of what carbon normally looks like. Where I say pi, sigma, pi, sigma. Okay? That ordering comes from what I told you on the slide. It comes from the fact that I say that the ordering is pi, sigma, um, pi star, sigma star. Your pi's will always go with the two, the two orbitals. So now we go through and we label everything just like before. We don't forget to draw our axes or label our atomic orbitals. And we don't forget to put in all our subscripts. So 2s down here and 2p for all of these. So now we can fill in our electrons. How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. So on the carbon side, we put four. Now how many electrons does oxygen have? Six. So on the oxygen side, let's put six. All right. Okay. 
So now going back to what the question asked us, I said draw the MO diagram and tell me the bond order. So this would be the MO diagram so far. Now we need to put our electrons in the center. So we don't really have to worry about where the electrons are coming from here. We just have to know how many we have. So how many electrons do we have to work with? Four from the carbon, six from the oxygen. So how many total? Ten. So we just start at the low energy and work our way up. We don't care whether they came from the carbon or whether they came from the oxygen. We just start down here. Okay. So we have that. So now what is the bond order? So we have to count up everything that's in our bonding orbitals, all our electrons, and everything that's in our antibonding orbitals. So bonding orbitals first. Two, four, six, eight. How many are in antibonding? What, how do we know that something's an antibonding orbital? It has a little star. So which are the only ones that have the star here that have electrons in it? This. So how many electrons? So what is our bond order? Good. So for CO, I could ask you what the bond order is and ask you to use the MO diagram to explain it. Now, while we're here and we have this, let's talk about ions one more time, just to sort of cement that. So if we were to make this, just because I don't necessarily want to redraw the atom, let's say we tried to make this a negative, okay? So new problem, let's make this a CO minus. So how would we do that? How could we make this a CO minus? Add another electron, right? So now, now let's do that. We'll make this a CO minus. You may want to make some, you know, you might want to actually end up redrawing this just for the sake of your notes. Um, okay, so now we have to add an extra electron in. The MO diagram part of it's kind of the easy place. Where in this case would we put the electron? The next, the, the, the first spot we can. So we can't put it in here, so we'll just put it in here. Now we have to make a little decision about where we're gonna put it as far as the atomic diagrams go. Are we gonna wanna put it on the carbon or the oxygen? So it's an electron. So we're gonna wanna give it to the one that wants electrons or doesn't want electrons? wants electrons. What's another word for wanting electron density? Negative. Electronegativity. So where would we want to put it on? The most electronegative or the least electronegative? Most. most, which is oxygen. So we just go ahead and add it there. Now let's look at what that does to the bond order. So before we bother calculating it, which we'll do in a sec, Let's think about what it would do. We added an electron to a bonding orbital or an antibonding orbital? Antibonding, right? It has a star. So we added it to an antibonding orbital. Does that mean it's gonna add to the bond order or take away from the bond order? It's gonna take away, right? It's antibonding. It, it stops it from bonding as well. Now, does that mean our bond order is gonna go up or down? Down. Anyone wanna guess by how much? Half, one, two, three? Half. Right? An electron adds or subtracts half of a bond because it's, uh, you ta it takes two electrons to make a bond. So guess before we fill into the formula, what is it going to end up being for a bond order? 2.5. All right, let's see if we're right real fast using the formula. We are, but we'll check it. So now we have 2, 4, 6, 8 in our bonding orbitals and then 2, 3 in our antibonding. And so we get 2.5. So just sort of a reminder on how ions work and an example of using an ion in a heteronuclear situation where you have to decide where the electrons go here or here. Okay. And if we were to do the plus version, what would we have done instead of adding an electron? Take away an electron, right? I chose to do minus here mostly because um, it was simpler to do on the page. Well, actually, good question though here. If we were to do the plus, where would we have taken the electron away over here? Would we have taken it from the carbon or the oxygen? The carbon, right? You're taking it away from the least electronegative. 
So keep that in mind too. Okay, so that finishes that slide. And this just shows the same thing that we just did. Again, make sure in your notes you sort of differentiate that we added in a problem here. Okay, and the next slide is sort of a checklist for you. Things that while grading exams, everybody forgets to do when drawing MO diagrams. So keep this in mind when you're going through and you're drawing these. When you're done drawing one on the exam, I mean, who knows if you'll have one on the exam or not, but you know. When you're done drawing one on the exam, make sure you check these. Did you label all the atomic orbitals? That's those one S's and the, or one S, one, two S and two P's. Lots of people forget to label those. Did you label the molecular orbitals? Did you add the star to the antibonding orbitals? That is not a point you want to lose, right? Because you forgot to add the stars. Make sure you add the stars to all the antibonding orbitals. Did you add or subtract the electrons appropriately <coughs> if you have an ion? Don't forget if I give you an ion, you need to make sure you go back and you say, well, I have an extra electron or I have a, a one less electron um, when you're drawing these. Did you use the proper order for the orbitals for the MOs? So what I mean by that is that issue of where you have oxygen, nitrogen, and or, yeah, oxygen, fluor oxygen, fluorine, and neon having one sort, and then all of the first ones having a different ordering, where that pi and sigma are flip-flopped, that's what I mean right there. So just keep this little checklist in your head of things that you need to go back and check every time you do it. Um, and along with this, don't forget your subscripts, okay? I wanna know where they come from. Did they come from your 1S? Did they come from your 2S? Did they come from your 2P? Sometimes when you see these, you'll also see the P's with a different label, the X, Y, and Z. I don't really care about that. Um, what are those referring to? Let's talk about it a minute, but it's talking about your axes, right? Whether you're in your, your X, Y, or Z. It, I don't think that matters to us quite as much because it depends on how you set up your axes. You could, no one says you have to set your axes a certain way, so I don't, I'm, I'm not bothering with that too much. Okay. So we've done an example of this already, but now I want to actually talk about it a little bit more in depth. Um, don't get too bothered by this equation yet. I, I don't want you guys zoning out on me because of it. Okay, so when we were adding and subtracting our orbitals for our homonuclear diatomics, or things that had the same atoms bonded together, H2, um, F2, O2, all of those, all of those orbitals, are the p orbitals from one oxygen different in energy from the p orbitals of a different oxygen? No, right? Why would they be any different? They're, the sa they're on the same atom. They have the same energy level. Now, what do you think, just taking a guess, if we take carbon and we take oxygen, are those energy levels going to be the same? Well, let's think about how would you know this? The only time that we've really sort of done energy level calculations was when we did the Rydberg equation. And we can't do the Rydberg equation for these because they have lots of electrons and th that doesn't work. But was the Rydberg equation, did we get the same energy levels for something like hydrogen and helium? No, right? Because we had to, there was a Z in there. We had to figure that into the calculation. We had to say, well, there's Z. So even in just a one electron system, is the, the energy levels of something like an oxygen or let's stick with lithium, a lithium and a hydrogen the same? No. So do we think that a carbon and an oxygen's energy levels would be the same? No. This factors into um, when, we're at, when we're trying to figure out where these orbitals are, okay? So if we have the p orbitals, and they've just drawn it as one line, which I don't really love. Um, it really kind of should be three lines. They've just drawn it as one for the sake of saving space and assuming that you know that there's three p orbitals. And same thing here. They, they add a little differently. And so what you end up getting is this huge mishmash of where all these orbitals fall into. Okay? This is not something that I, need, I want you to replicate. It's just something that I want you to sort of understand. So... Um, if you have a polar covalent bond, they're going to be shared differently than if you have a nonpolar covalent bond. That's what I want you to get out of the slide, okay? So for that section of the book, which is the main reason I bring this up, 
just know that for you, for all of these sorts of situations where you have a polar covalent bond, they're going to be shared differently than a non-polar covalent or a non-polar covalent bond. And that's all I really care that you get from this section of the book for now. If you go on to physical chemistry, you'll learn a lot more about this. But just for now, know that they don't add the same way. That's what this equation right here says. They don't add the same way. And we're going to sort of leave it at that for now. Any time that I ask you to do one of these heteronuclear diatomics, I'll tell you the ordering of the energy. I'll do what I did here, where I say that for the p orbitals, you're going to get this, you're going to get that. Okay? And so that's all you'll need to know. That's how sapling does it as well. If you even hopefully going through and doing your sapling homework, they do the same thing. I think you have to figure out NO and CO at some point in that homework. And they'll tell you the ordering. They'll say, here's sigma, here's pi, here's this, here's that. And you'll just fill in the electrons. It's the same way for the exam. OK. Now, something I should mention here since we aren't doing it. Any of the, there's a whole section on the book where you have this sort of thing worked out for water and benzene and a few other ones. We're not going to worry about polyatomic ions and M, or polyatomic molecules and NMO theory. That really goes beyond the scope of this class, so don't worry about that section of the book. It's interesting, and if you're going to go on in chemistry, even into organic, you should skim through it and you should look at it. But it's not going to be tested. Things that you do need to be able to do for the exam. You have to be able to do the homonuclear diatomics from scratch. You know, I hand you a blank sheet of paper and say, draw me oxygen and tell me something about it. You know, finding the bond order of it. That you have to be able to do. For the heteronuclear diatomics, I'll draw you the energy levels or I'll just tell you the ordering the way sapling does it and then you'll be able to draw it from the orderings and fill in all your electrons. Make sure you know how to do ions with both of these, right? Both of these are ions are fair game, so make sure you know how to do that. Okay. So, moving on to chapter five. If you, depending on what iteration of the notes you printed out, you may have some extra slides in there, just cross those out. Okay. So, chapter five. We're only going to cover 5.1 through 5.6 in this class. All the rest is going to be taken care of in 1B. I think it's the first thing you hit in 1B, too. But there's a section of this chapter that works really well with what we were talking about with dipoles and covalent or polar covalent molecules and things of that sort. And it really works better to sort of fit it into there before moving on. And so that's why we cover it here. So it's just the one section. So what we're going to get into here, and you kind of want to do a mind shift here into thinking about what we were talking about when we were talking about the dipoles and what makes a molecule polar, because we're really sort of doing a 180 um, in, in thought processes here. So we're back to Lewis structures and dipoles. OK, so the main part of this chapter that we want to talk about here is what is an intermolecular force? So let's break down the word, because most things in science, you can sort of break down the word and get an idea for what's happening. Inter, that's between different things, right? Internet is between different things. What is the word for between something that's the same, within one thing? Yeah. Intra. So that'll come up here or there, where we'll talk about intramolecular forces. So keep that in mind, too. But inter is between different things. Molecular, as relating to molecules, right? So intermolecular force is going to be forces between two different molecules. So it's the idea that you have two different molecules, and those two different molecules are going to interact with each other. And they're going to interact with each other in different ways, depending on what those molecules' own properties are. Not all molecules are going to interact with each other the exact same way. OK, so we have a bunch of different types of forces that we're going to be talking about here. So the first are what we've sort of covered up until now, mostly, is intramolecular forces. These are bonds that are within a molecule. So that's where this becomes intra. These are covalent bonds. We've already talked about these. There's not really a huge amount in this chapter that we're going to talk about with the intramolecular forces here. For intermolecular forces, now we have a bunch of new ones. 
And these are all going to be weaker than a covalent bond. A covalent bond is relatively stable, right? If you have this covalent bond formed, you have to really do something to break it apart. The reason it formed was because it was more stable. Now, intermolecular forces, these are much, much weaker. These are going to be a little bit more transient. Um, you'll have them, but they're going to be switching between different molecules, let's say. So these are your four different ones. As is normal, I sort of have them all listed out for you here, and we're going to go into each one in more depth in a minute. But we're going to have dipole-dipole forces. We're going to have hydrogen bonds, which is actually just a really particular type of dipole-dipole force. Um, and then we have ion dipole and dispersion forces. So what you want to get out of all of these different slides is what sort of molecules will form these particular ones, what type of strengths you're looking at, because not all of these are going to be the same strength. And then we'll also get into the idea of what is that going to do to its sort of bulk properties. For instance, boiling point and melting point. What's going to change about things of that sort based on these forces? Okay. First one we want to talk about. Dipole-dipole forces. Okay. So these are attractive forces between polar molecules. So if you have two, if you have a polar molecule, this is the sort of force you can get. So if I were to ask you, does this molecule have, a, have dipole dipole forces? The first thing you're going to ask yourself is what? Is it polar? And if the answer is yes, well, then it has dipole dipole forces. If the answer is no, then it doesn't have dipole dipole forces. Now, the way that these work is it, it kind of, you can think of it as the, all of these molecules being little tiny magnets. If it has a dipole, that means that one side has a positive charge and one side has a negative charge. So what is the positive side of one molecule going to want to do to the molecules around it? Attract the negative side or the positive side? <laughs> yeah, if it's positive, it's going to pull the negative side toward it and it's going to push the positive side away from it. And so what happens is, is they are, they're sort of attracted to each other because of this. Now, these are, sort of, these are going to be the strongest except for hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is actually where you have hydrogen bonded to particular atoms and you have a ridiculously strong dipole right there in that little general area. And so it's sort of an extension of the dipole-dipole force idea. So this is going to have increasing strength as the dipole of the molecule increases. What does that mean? So that means if we have a molecule that's really, really polar, and we have a molecule that's not very polar, the one that's really, really polar is going to have more dipole-dipole forces. OK? All right, I'm actually seeing some confused looks about that. So let me, let me do something there. <laughs> What I mean by that is, let's say we have something like, let's draw this out like a line structure, since we haven't had a lot of practice with line structures. So we have that. And we'll do a different one. And let's say we have that. OK. So what I meant by comparing the dipole-dipole forces and their strength is that first you would have to decide which one has a higher dipole. First of all, do we think that each of these is going to have a dipole? Are they polar? So we have a carbon in three H's, a carbon, and a carbon in three H's. Don't forget your rules for line structures. So let's draw this out a little bit expanded in case you've forgotten how your line structures work. We'd have that. And then over here, Oops. 
Sorry, that should just be an H. We would have that, right? So that's sort of expanded out. Don't forget how to do that. That was the thing that I kind of sent home as you know a homework lecture um, in a video. So you can review that as much as you like. So what do we think? Would that have a, does that have any polar bonds in it, first of all? That's our first question. The carbon to the oxygen, that's polar, right? Does this have any polar bonds? Carbon to the bromine. So we get a dipole going toward the more polar or the more electronegative atom, right? We know that they're polar bonds because we're looking at the difference in electronegativity. We're saying that has a high electronegativity, that has a low electronegativity. High electronegativity, low electronegativity. Okay. So now to decide which one has more dipole forces, we'd have to decide which dipole is stronger. So which one's more electronegative? So I tried to set these up as close as possible to the same sort of atom. Which one's more electronegative, oxygen or bromine? Oxygen. So which one would have the greater dipole? Oxygen. So which one has more dipole forces? Oxygen. Okay. So that's what I mean here. Increasing strength as the dipole of the molecule increases. Let's do one more example, an even simpler. Well, actually, we can't do that one yet. Never mind. Okay. So this sort of sums up dipole-dipole force. So if I ask you if something has a dipole force, you say, is it polar? Or more likely, I'll give you an atom and, or a molecule, and I'll say, what sort of intermolecular forces does it have? And you'll say, okay, well, does it have a dipole? Yes. So it has dipole-dipole forces. Okay, so the next one then that we're going to talk about is if we take this to the extreme. Hydrogen bonds. So what do we know about um, oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine? What is special about those three atoms that has something to do with this? It has very high electronegativity, right? Your three highest on your periodic table. Now, so something happens if you take and you bond a hydrogen to the oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine. And what happens is, is you get something called hydrogen bonding. What's really important here is to notice what is and isn't the hydrogen bond. This is an intermolecular force, right? Inter. So that means between the same molecule or within one molecule or between different molecules. Different molecules. So one molecule of, or of water and another molecule of water. One molecule of ammonia, another molecule of ammonia, or one of each, either way. So what happens here is you get hydrogen that is covalently bonded. So that means you have an actual bond, something like this bond in water. That's covalently bonded. So this hydrogen and this oxygen are covalently bonded to each other. Now, if you take hydrogen and you bond it to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, in other words, your three most electronegative elements, You'll, get, you'll have an atom or a molecule that is capable of hydrogen bonding. But don't forget it's occurring between two different molecules. Now, so right here, let's look at this a second before we move on. If you have the, two water molecules near each other, what ends up happening, the way this ends up working, is that your oxygen molecule is gonna have a little bit of a negative charge, right? because oxygen is very highly electronegative. It's stealing the electron density away from this hydrogen that's right here. So you get a little bit of a negative charge here and a little bit of a positive side, a charge here. So what'll happen is just like in the dipole-dipole forces, you'll have this attracting to this. We have a negative attracting to the positives. And then we could draw a whole bunch of these and say, well, you have a positive here, attract that to another atom's negative, another atom's positive, and just kind of zigzag all the way around. But if I draw you this, and I say point to the hydrogen bond, and you point to this, are you going to get your points? No. That is a covalent bond. That is not a hydrogen bond. This is the hydrogen bond. The hy and it's not really a real bond, right? It's these intermolecular forces. So this hydrogen bond is between one atom's positive or delta positive side and another molecule's delta negative side, okay? So make sure you, you remember that, two different molecules. Now, something like ammonia can do it too. 
where you have NH here, NH here, and NH here. So you have these three bonds. Your hydrogens all take on a little bit of a positive charge. Your oxygen or your nitrogen takes on a little bit of a negatively charged. And the negative side of the nitrogen would be attracted to other sides of the other, if, if we were just looking at ammonia, other positive sides of other ammonia atoms or molecules, other ammonia molecules. Now, I put this picture in so that you can see that you don't actually only have hydrogen bonding between exactly the same atoms or molecules. You might have, if you have a mixture of ammonia and water in some situation, um, you could actually get them hydrogen bonding to each other. That's fine. Now, the more hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, the higher the difference in properties, okay? So this means something like water, where you have two, is going to be, it's going to have a, a very high amount of hydrogen bonding, where maybe something that doesn't have as many hydrogen bond donors or acceptors would have less. And you have some really big examples of that um, when you get to your worksheet, where you can go through and you can circle all the places where it's possible to hydrogen bond in your discussion. Okay. The more hydrogen bond donors and acceptors you have, the higher the difference in properties. So this is what I was talking about on that last little section. I just sort of want to talk about it a bit more. So here we have some ball and stick models where all of these gray areas are your carbons. So carbon, 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 carbon. And then the reds are your oxygens and the whites are your hydrogen. All right. Just a different way of representing molecules that I thought I'd put up for you to see. So what we're going to do here at the end is we're going to say, well, all of these different forces affect your boiling point. The more forces you have, the more your boiling point's affected. So something like this molecule, how many hydrogen bond donors and acceptors do you have? You have this section where you have a hydrogen and a hydrogen and a hydrogen that's bonded to an oxygen. So three, and then you have an acceptor here, an acceptor here, an acceptor here, okay? What I mean by acceptor and donor, this is a hydrogen that's being sort of donated to this bond, so it's the donor and this is the acceptor. Okay, so here we have three. Notice you have a really, really high boiling point, 290 degrees Celsius. Here, how many do we have? We have two, right? One here and one here. And we have a little bit lower of a boiling point. Sure, it's still high, but it's, it's lower than this one. Now we look at water, where we just have two of the donors, and there's the two lone pairs, so arguably two acceptors. But you have less. It's 100. So we go from one of these situations to two to three. And we go from 100 to 188 to 290, okay? So we haven't exactly talked about this boiling point phenomena in detail yet, but this is how we're going to sort of decide which ones have more intermolecular forces, is which ones have the higher boiling point. So we'll do that next time. So the last few types of, we have two more to get through, which we're obviously not going to finish up today. But let's talk about ion dipole forces now. This one's very similar to dipole dipole, except now you actually have an actual ion in there instead of just two molecules with a dipole. So if we have an ion, do we think that's going to interact with a polar molecule? Well, sure. We're thinking magnets again, right? If we have a positively charged ion, what is that going to do to the negative side of another molecule? It's going to attract it. If we have a negative ion, it's going to um, repel the negative side. So whenever you have a situation like this, a positive ion attracts the negative side, and a negative ion attracts the positive side. Sorry, that was not supposed to click off. Okay. So this is very similar to a dipole-dipole force. Now, 
kind of take note here, this is normally going to occur in what sort of situation? One compound, two compounds? Two compounds, right? A good example of this, where you also have some hydrogen bonding going on, but is something like salt and water. This is why salt dissolves so easily in water, is you have positive ions and you have negative ions, and those positively charged and negatively charged ions in the sodium chloride, the water is going to come in and surround them, and it's going to make it really easy to actually dissolve the salt. So this is sort of one of the reasons why this, you know, like dissolved likes exist.